mysterywire.com, home of the unusual and unknown. From Area 51 to the paranormal, it's your source to the most vetted UFO stories and special investigations in the world. Take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you with us here for another edition of the Mystery Wire podcast. We've got uh, glad to have everybody together here again. That doesn't happen very often. Even virtually, it's hard to get together sometimes. But we've got Matt Adams with us, chief photographer here at 8 News Now, and worked with George and a lot of the investigative stuff. And uh, Duncan Phoenix, who has put together Mystery Wire and made some great things happen with that as producer of it. And of course, George Knapp um, with us here, the guy who, uh, who started all the, the, the phenomenon, uh, we'll say, of, of what's, what's happened with Mystery Wire. I'm Ron Futrell. We will talk about the phenomenon, the, the movie, quite a bit here today. But first, George, a big anniversary coming up on Sunday. And I remember when you first started reporting on the, the TTSA uh, to the Stars Academy and everything about what was happening there with Tom DeLong, and now three years, a fast three years for you. And uh, to tell us about how this all started back, that first meeting up in Seattle. Yeah, it, it's a, it, the th this three years has gone by in a blur. I mean, for a variety of reasons, not just in UFO world, but we had developed a sort of a friendship with Tom DeLong. I think 2012, Matt and I were on a trip to central Nevada, running around in the hinterlands, and my phone rang, and it was Tom DeLong. And we started talking about UFOs. And I didn't really know who Tom DeLong was. I'd heard about the band Blink-182. But we kind of hit it off and started the dialogue and, and started conversing. In uh, 2016, Tom created something called To the Stars. That's an umbrella company that handled his books and publications and uh, music and things of that sort. He had a storefront in Encinitas. We went down to see him, did an interview. He gave us a tour of the place. But he already had... Uh, irons in the fire, bigger fish to fry. He had developed a uh, relationships and an ongoing conversation with a number of people in the intelligence and military uh, communities to talk about UFOs. Tom has had a passion about UFOs since he was a little kid before he was a big rock, punk rock star. And he used his name to sort of get a foot in the door. Uh, his fame uh, got him in the door at a major aerospace uh, event. And he started talking to people about UFOs they kind of gave him a bad time at first, but eventually he was he persevered. Uh, he was knowledgeable about the subject. We had done a couple of interviews on radio, and uh, he worked his way up the food chain. And um, they started trusting him to, to know more about the inner workings of how things went. And uh, eventually he expanded that. So October 11th, 2017, three years ago this Sunday, he steps out on a stage in Seattle, uh, in, uh, in Seattle, Washington, and he's surrounded by a couple of guys who had spent their entire lives living in the shadows. There was uh, Dr. Hal Putoff, who was a world famous physicist who had worked for the CIA, who had been primarily responsible for developing what we now know as remote viewing, a technique for sort of projecting human consciousness, which the CIA and army had studied and governments around the world had studied. Also on the stage was a, a guy named Jim Semivan, who was a lifer with the CIA had done uh, overseen a lot of very sensitive pro uh, projects and programs. Uh, also there was Steve Justice, who was sort of the chief engineer for special projects for Lockheed Skunk Works, the, the, the same company that produced all those amazing aerial platforms that were developed and tested out at Area 51. If anybody would know about how advanced aerospace technology, things like the Tic Tac would work, it was Steve Justice. Also on the stage was a guy named Chris Mellon, who's from one of the most famous uh, families, um, dynasties in American finance, uh, who had devoted his life to public service, worked for a decade in Congress for the U.S. Senate, the Intelligence Committee, overseeing sensitive pro programs and projects, and also had moved on to the Pentagon, where he spent another 10 years as a chief intelligence guy looking at special projects, had been to Area 51 and other sensitive installations. He knew where all the bodies were buried, and then, of course, the last guy to be introduced um, on that day, October 11th, as, as Tom DeLong is announcing the creation of To The Stars Academy, was someone that no one had ever heard of before named Lou Elizondo. Elizondo was a lifelong counterintelligence officer. He had a number of really highly classified uh, programs and projects under his responsibility. He had been a boots on the ground kind of guy in Afghanistan and other theaters. He had uh, targeted drug cartels, terrorist organizations, a real solid guy who had a 
who had a great career going, who could have stayed there forever, uh, but he chose to walk away. Two days before this event in, in Seattle, Lou walked away from the Pentagon uh, because he was disgusted how the UFO subject was being treated. He, he realized after working with a program that we came to be known as ATIP for 10 years or so, that the government was not paying attention, that this was just, it was being studied in secrecy and then shoved off into a drawer somewhere. So there's Lou steps on stage that day on, uh, three years ago and says, I'm Lou Elizondo. I was in charge of a program called ATIP and the phenomena is real. And it was, it's sort of, it was a really big deal looking back on it now. But at the time, KLAS, the I team, uh, Matt and I, were the only TV news organizations to cover the story. The only other major mainstream news organization was USA Today. Leslie Kane wrote an article about it. Um, and there was some buzz that was created in the UFO community. But in general, uh, the world went, meh, no big deal. Uh, two months later, though, things changed. So um, let's hear the clip from Lou Elizondo from that day, and then we'll pick up the conversation after that. For nearly the last decade, I ran a sensitive aerospace threat identification program focusing on unidentified aerial technologies. It was in this position I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. So that was uh, three years ago. Now, three years later, a lot has changed, not just in the UFO world, in the world in general. But uh, there's been a series of New York Times articles there's, uh, there's been much more research that's uh, been published out there. Uh, I know George and, and myself on the Mystery Wire site, we've been releasing a lot more uh, lately. Um, and this has led to quite literally a, f a phenomenon, a new one, to use the uh, word of the movie that's out this week. Um, Matt, you, you've been in this quite a bit. Uh, how have you seen it change in the past three years? Well, I think there's a lot of people who are a lot more willing to to actually discuss this in a in an open way. And it's really strange. I, I feel like I don't know if it is kind of the slow softening that all this has happened, but there are people that are now talking about this that I just couldn't even see five years ago, them even holding a, a regular conversation. So I think it has opened it up. And and I know that you know even within my own circle of, of friends and family like there was a time that you know it was kind of chuckled at and and now people are kind of sitting back and they're they're looking at all the evidence that's that's that we have put out all the stuff that, that we've broken and also the stuff of the new york times and and now the phenomenon as well as um i think a big part of it was also the lazar movie and the skidwalker movie i think this stuff hits mainstream and people start and and it, and when the stuff is done well, whenever it's done not hokey and it's not done as a way to, to you know, little green men, it really changes the way people react to it. And I think that has been a, a huge part of it, too, is that the subject is being um, broached in a serious manner. It, it's not a joke. There's something that is happening that can't be explained. And our government admits that that's the case. So uh, I think, think that helps quite a bit. We, uh, we followed that, that, that event in Seattle via live feed. So TTSA provided this live feed. Uh, and again, it landed kind of with a thud with news media. We figured, hey, this is going to be a really big story. There's a guy who says, we've been secretly studying UFOs. I'm the one who's in charge. This is going to be headline news everywhere. But of course, it, it didn't. Uh, what happened, I think Lou Elizondo came forward thinking he'd be get some attaboys for uh, putting his career on the line, his credibility on the line, to come forward and share this information with the public. What he got was nothing but grief. I mean, for years, the UFO people, all the people who make a living at this stuff on podcasts and blogs and consider themselves authorities, went nuts uh, teeing off on him. Uh, he's a phony. It's not true. The name of the program, it didn't have anything to do with UFOs. And the Pentagon was happy to play along with that for a long time, uh, feeding disinformation and misinformation and constantly had to, to uh, take back things that it had released to the public about Lou, about ATIP, which as we learned a few minute, months after the New York Times story had actually started this OSAP. It started as something else, which we at Mystery Wire had reported on. Um, one of the things we, we interviewed Lou about a month and a half after the New York Times story we got the first big long form sit down with Lou 
uh, about ATEP and his career. And he had shared with us, uh, actually, I had met him two days after that event in Seattle. He came down and he showed me the Tic Tac video, as well as another one of those videos that we now know have been released uh, by the Pentagon. And uh, he told me at the time that his boss at the Pentagon was not in the loop. He had no idea that Lou was running this program. It was somebody higher up that had given him the authorization. And his immediate supervisor wasn't in the loop and was pretty ticked off. And the first they knew about the program was when Lou stepped up on that stage. So they were pretty mad. And you've seen that manifested in several ways since then is that Lou has been uh, denigrated. There have been uh, these uh, little subterranean programs to stick a shib in him, to ruin his reputation, to doubt his credibility. And for a long time, I think he probably was thinking that he had made a bad decision in taking the step that he took. But uh, he's persevered. And I think uh, the reporting and truth has, uh, has come forward up to the point where he's been, uh, uh, you know, this decision he made has been justified and proven to be the right one. And, and now, the, why do you think why, why do you think that the the other you know mass media ignored this thing? I mean, you got Tom DeLong and and maybe there's some credibility issues with with Tom and you know people see they they see him as a rock star and a little kid. They don't see the serious side of him. And then they could pick on Elizondo because a lot of the stuff he claims is very difficult to verify. But then you've got You've got three other people up there who nobody doubts their qualifications. Nobody doubts their bona fides. And just a couple of years before, there was a, a WikiLeaks release that showed Tom DeLong showing up on other government emails talking about these things as well as, as George Knapp. Um, so it just seems disingenuous. Why, why was it just kind of brushed aside? Yeah, that's that's the question. I mean, it's the same way. Why has science been able to ignore this? Why has journalism been able to avoid it? It's like they jump right over things like that and ignore it. It can't be, therefore it isn't. It's a lot easier to poke fun at it and make jokes and, and uh, make fun of somebody in a silly uh, tinfoil hat than it is to do the work. You know, Matt, you know how hard this is to put this stuff together and put it in, together in a credible way. Well, it's what all of us do for Mystery Wire. It's, it's a challenge. Um, you have to dot your I's and cross your T's and, and go the extra mile to make sure you're reporting things correctly. And for Lou, you know, that, that the topic has been made fun of for so long, including in circles that he traveled. There were most of the people that he worked with had no idea what he was doing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an easy thing to make fun of. It's a lot harder to get your head around it and, and look at it as a serious phenomenon, but it, it's coming around. We've, met, we've come a long way in three years. The, the world has come a long way on this subject. And, and it's not just journalists that it's, you know, it used to be taboo for that's opening up uh, the lawmakers. I mean, in public are now, not all of them, but some of them are talking about this. And, and, and that has definitely been a change in the last three years. That's, that's a large part to do not only with Lou Elizondo, but Chris Mellon. He's sort of the unsung hero, very quietly working behind the scenes all this time to get members of Congress to take a look at this stuff. And right after that New York Times story broke, you know, we talked to Harry Reid about it. He had, you know, he gave us the first interview on camera and told us that his phone had been ringing off the hook since the story came out. Colleagues of his, elected officials who had no idea this was going on, who were interested in it. And, uh, and he and Chris Mellon and Elizondo and DeLong and some of the others had helped facilitate this. So they had people at the Pentagon who got requests from members of Congress who figured now that the New York Times has covered this, it is at least respectable enough for other media to cover it. And that gives them cover. It gives them political cover to go ahead and ask questions. So the first briefings in the months after that, December 2017, there were these briefings behind closed doors for members of the Senate Intelligence and Armed Services Committee staff. And then they started having elected members having these briefings. And these guys, once they saw the evidence that's in possession of the Pentagon, they were blown away. They saw these, the three videos that have been released, but they also saw a lot more that we have not been allowed to see yet. And they're interested, they're hooked. We, we had an interview with Duncan a couple of months ago with, or at least a couple of weeks ago with Senator Marco Rubio, who is now the chairman of Senate Intelligence Committee. And he makes no bones about it. They are looking into this. They are supporting the UAP task force that's now underway that is investigating UFO incidents 
not only encounters with the U.S. military units, but also a much broader range of topics similar to what OSAP did. And, and the guys at uh, TTSA, they, you know, they've not only been able to broach into the, the, the government end of things, they've, they are taking a, a stab at entertainment, too, because they have their own uh, the History Channel TV show that has been quite popular. Um, and I believe is uh, re-upping for another season at this point. So uh, uh, that's great. That's getting out into the into very much the mainstream populace. Yeah, it's the thing with UFOs. You go to these conferences, as I used to do, like once a month. Matt and I would go trotting off to one in Laughlin or or LA or something like that, and you see the same people over and over again at them year after year. This because of TTSA and the, their effort to get the mainstream media to cover this. There's such a much broader audience for this material than ever looked at it before. That's what you have to do. You have to reach out. You can't just be preaching to the choir, or singing to the choir. You have to reach out to a broader audience. And that, that really started with TTSA and Tom DeLong and his team uh, kicking this thing off three years ago this week. And, and, uh, and it's an ongoing process. I, I hope we're part of it. People consider us part of it as well. Yeah, and Tom also has a series of books that are being produced by TTSA and they're fiction. Uh, but if you, uh, if people are able to filter through the fiction and read between the lines, there's a, there's a lot to be gleaned from those books as well that maybe is not quite fiction. We have some nonfiction books as well. I, Bob Lazar's book was uh, put out by TTSA. Um, and then there's some, uh, there's some other nonfiction projects that are underway that uh, are common. I, I, I'm not in the loop to, uh, with all that stuff, but I know he's got a lot of irons in the fire. Um, and that sort of leads us to where our second topic for this podcast was about this movie coming out this week. Um, Ron, I don't know if you want to take it from there. Yeah, I, well, okay. I, I watched the trailer. Okay, and the, the trailer was gripping. The trailer was fascinating. Some of the stuff I had heard before, some of the stuff was sort of new new to me and, some, uh, and, and the topics that I'd seen. And I've jumped into a lot of this stuff with you guys here. So I'm familiar with it and appreciate it. And it was, no, it was, the trailer was very well done, by the way. You guys said that you know the, the producers of the trailer. Uh, I'm, I have high hopes for this movie as being something that will be, well, phenomenal, that will be phenomenal, uh, that will be something that could, could it provide a sea change? Is one of my questions to you, George. The other one is, what do you think? Um, tell me about the movie itself. What are we going to see? when we rent, because you can't go to the theaters, obviously now, you gotta download this and rent it. So I'm planning on doing that this weekend. Tell me about this movie, The Phenomenon. James Fox, James Fox has produced a, a couple of other documentaries about the UFO subject. Uh, about seven years ago, he started working on this project. Uh, he had some backers who uh, supported him financially and uh, he wanted to uh, cast the widest possible net to tell uh, stories that were well known in the UFO world, but which were barely known outside UFO circles. Uh, some of the best documented cases from around the world. He traveled the globe, um, interviewed the, the most credible people, uh, including some people in government. He's four years into this thing when the New York Times story breaks and it changes, you know, the earth moves under his feet. So he suddenly has to regroup and restart and refocus because of all the events that we've just talked about that have happened in the last three years. So uh, it is an ambitious effort. It uh, goes right to the top. Uh, John Podesta is one of the people interviewed. We arranged to help James get in touch with Harry Reid, who gave a great interview, uh, said some of the things that he's told us in the interviews that are on Mystery Wire. Um, we shared with him uh, some foreign information that we had obtained from Russia. Um, well, I'll tell you what, let's take a look at the trailer. We'll talk on the other side. There are cases that are not explainable in conventional terms that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. When we got right up to it, it lit up. Was this a warning? Was this an attempt to communicate? Felt scared. I was running and playing and then I saw this maroon color in the sky. It was not anything from this earth. He was looking at all of us. Maybe they're trying to communicate. They were reaching out to us. 
there is an immense array of unanswered questions and an urgent need to get to the bottom of it. The public has a right to know. My gosh, look at that thing. The question is no longer if they are here, but why. What are they doing? What do they want from us? What are their motivations? For over 75 years, there have been sightings in the sky. The UFO shut down several missile silos in Montana. Thousands of witnesses worldwide. It had to be a data collection. I'm sure they scanned the warhead. Just kind of hovering there. It never changed its longitudinal axis. And then it goes poof and it takes off off the side. And high level cover ups. The government was covering up what happened at Roswell. Hiding these dark secrets. I was told there wasn't anything there when I knew there was. People need to know there is something else out there. Yes, there have been visitation, crashed craft, material recovered. Shouldn't we be spending some money to study all these phenomena? I knew this was breaking news for the front page of the New York Times. They were trying to communicate, trying to tell us something. Now it's time to tell people about it. These things are real, they're here, this is happening now. Okay, so I, I think I raised expectations a little bit with that trailer, but it met and exceeded the expectations. Definitely. As, when you see it. Okay, I'm struck by the the young British children that are obviously with accents, with their teacher. They must have been on a class outing at some point and seen something uh, that that he had those interviews, along with all the all the experts that are seen in that trailer and all the people that are... Uh, that, that uh, you know, we got an Apollo 14 astronaut in there, okay? But the, the children caught me a little bit too to hear them. What What's that case about, George? Um, it's not, a, they're not British. They're uh, oh, from African nation. This happened uh, a long South time Africa? ago. South Africa? Yeah. They South? yeah. Oh, that's, okay. Um, and uh, and James was able to track down them as adults and, and see if their memories uh, were consistent with what they said when they were kids. And of course, kids are not going to make that stuff up. Kids are not going to lie about it, not going to tell their teachers and their parents. There were a lot of witnesses for that case, and it had not received a lot of attention here in the U.S., uh, so it's going to be a new story for most of the people who see that film. The other thing I think I want to mention about the trailer, uh, a company called Buddha Jones, which is maybe the most creative trailer house in uh, Hollywood, made that trailer, and Matt and I got to know them because they did the trailers for the Bob Lazar movie and the Skinwalker Ranch movie as well. So they're, they're wizards at putting together great stuff. Um, they, in addition, they released another clip from the film that uh, focuses on a UFO case that you would think everyone would know because of the name involved, but with few people outside of the UFO world have ever heard of. Gordo Cooper, Gordon Cooper, the right stuff, one of the first seven Mercury astronauts uh, a, 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 an American hero, if you've ever seen one, uh, had his own UFO encounter, and he tells the story uh, on some film that was incorporated into James Fox's movie, The Phenomenon. Let's see that. In 1951, future astronaut Gordon Cooper, while training in Germany, chased a large formation with his squadron of fighter jets. Unlike fighters, they would stop, almost stop in their forward velocity and change 90 degrees, sometimes in their flight path. And within the next two to three days, we'd had uh, practically all the fighters we could muster on the base up climbing as high as they would climb with guys with binoculars in them, still trying to spot these strange devices flying overhead. And we never could get close enough really to pin them down, but they were round in shape and very metallic looking. And they would come over and do the same maneuvers that we make, except every once in a while one of them would go zip. And you just can't do that in a fighter. So there you go. Uh, word straight from Gordon Cooper um, about what he, uh, he says he saw. Um, and that's just a tiny little clip of what's in there. Um, when George and I had a chance to uh, speak with James Fox, the director, the filmmaker, um, he told some amazing stories, and, and we're going to play that for you here in just a minute. One of them that, that I found interesting, a name that, that's brought up quite often in the UFO community, Jacques Vallée, 
Um, you know, people are saying, where is he? You know, why isn't he talking? All this. Well, it turns out that uh, James Fox got more than just a few minutes with him. Right, George? Yes, Jacques became sort of the godfather of this production. That's the way James explains it. Is he, he oversaw everything. He was sort of the quality control officer. And if the facts weren't exactly right, everything that was reported in the movie, Jacques Vallée was the guy who was there to tell him about it. And many of these cases are ones that Jacques investigated himself, uh, either personally or as an associate of J. Allen Hynek, who was the chief investigator for Project Blue Book. Um, Jacques also worked with NIDS. He worked with OSAP and ATIP uh, in, as, a, as a consultant. And, um, and man, if you're going to have one guy oversee your production, Jacques is the guy you'd want. So we, we talked to J James about his film, and here's the interview. James, I was, I was trying to do the math. I looked up what is the gestation period for elephants, and it's, it's basically a year and a half. So the time that you've spent working on this you could have given birth to four elephants working on five, right? Well, I started I started uh, concept to completion. I was 43 when I started and I just turned 52. <laughs> that's that's a good little stint, don't you think? That's a big chunk of your life. Yeah, it is. My son, it's all he knows. He's, you know, he just turned six. Daddy, daddy, when, when is this movie ever gonna come out? <laughs> His whole life. Uh, and then you're you're what four four and a half years into it, and then things hit the fan. New York Times breaks this story. I mean, I, I think you probably had it in mind what your film was going to be before a tip, tic tac, all that, and then you had to the ground changed beneath your feet. You know, it's funny actually because people were asking me during production the first four years. So how are you gonna how are you gonna end this movie? What's what's gonna happen? Is it gonna be a new? And I said, you know, the pattern ebb and flow with this with this topic. I'm sure something big is gonna happen. There's gonna be a sighting or something good, but I never dreamed that it would be something uh, on the front page of the New York Times. I mean, that was, you couldn't have asked for a better story for us. I mean, it, it added another couple of years of production to the film, but I mean, my God, it was, you know, it was, it was a dream come true. Well, yeah, I mean, the whole narrative changes for you, but you were able to adapt. Oh, absolutely. You know, well, we, well, as soon as it happened, I, I said to the people I was working with, look, all right, this changes everything. We have to go after this story. We have to go after, you know, the people involved, you know, Christopher Mellon and Senator Harry Reid and obviously the pilots and whatever information we could, we could get together. And, and we literally realized we're going to be probably filming another year and a half. Um, and so, you know, it, you, you know, as I've stated before, you were critical in, in making some of those interviews, actually landing some of those interviews, uh, Senator Harry Reid, in which we are forever grateful. So the phenomenon launches today on multiple uh, streaming platforms. You had hoped uh, that the debut would be in theaters nationwide. We had, the ink was barely dry on the contracts. We had roughly 1,500 theaters across the United States. And, and, and funny, this is something I'd never done before and I was really excited about it. This sound engineer said to me, look, if you're gonna be in theaters, you better do a 5.1 surround mix. This requires a, a proper engineer and, and, and it's probably six to eight weeks of work. But because you're gonna be in theaters, I, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of having right sound. People will get irritated and be bothered and they won't know exactly what to pinpoint what it is. So we did that. In fact, we had to like, t I had to take out a bank loan to pay for it because it was ridiculously expensive. But, you know, everybody told me in the field that, look, you've got to do this. So the film's got theatrical 5.1 Dolby surround mix, which I just hope there are people that at home that have it because it makes all the difference in the world for your to view. What did you want it to accomplish? I, and I ask that in this context is that you have such a, a cool mix of classic cases from around the world. Uh, some that UFO people like me might be somewhat familiar with, but didn't know in detail. And then current events, political intrigue, uh, government uh, cover-up type issues. It, it's a great mix of, of both uh, the, the hardcore political realities and then uh, how, how these, this phenomena has affected people on a human level. So, you know, what I'd set out to do and I've been trying, this is my fourth film on the topic, is to transcend the UFO community and to penetrate a much broader audience, to present tangible evidence to mainstream that could be accepted, digested. Not that I'm trying to, you know, 
prophesize around the world to get people to join my cult of believers. That's that's not what I'm saying. But to to create the seminal doc, feature length documentary film that would focus on that core 10 or 12 percent of truly inexplicable cases. And I used to kind of joke around in the studio and, you know, we would say, you know, where are we going? And and we and I would remind everyone we're on that was if I can get people at the end of this movie to walk out of the theater thinking that that landing event that happened in Africa in 1994 might have just happened. In other words, these occupants, I mean, it's such a tall order to, to think, right, that these occupants, there was a landing at a school, the occupants got out and they interacted telepathically with school children. You walk down the street and you talk to the average Joe, he's going to look at you like, what, you know, what have you been smoking? And, and I knew what I was up against. And so we kept reminding ourselves in the studio, road to Rua. If we're going to transcend the UFO community, the average person's not going to have any more knowledge than Area 51 in Roswell. So we had to kind of go over some of the, the historical stuff to, to, to prime people, to prepare people for the event that occurs at the end of the film. And I think that we did it. Is it your hope that the, the film not only describes the change that is underway, but becomes a part of it, an agent of change, and that this is the kind of thing that somebody like Chris Mellon could take to members of Congress and say, here, watch this, and then we'll talk after you become familiar with the topic. I, uh, the other night, uh, when Lou Elizondo tweeted support for the film and said, this film says things that I could not. It's accurate. I was at the Pentagon. I've seen the evidence. Um, that was one of the finest, best moments for me because that stamp of legitimacy and that, that endorsement from a fellow that, uh, that's in a position to know, um, to me, that was mission accomplished. Uh, you build, uh, you sort of build on the shoulders of uh, giants in the field. Jacques Vallée, who was a key advisor to the film, not easy to get him to go along with something like this, I would imagine. No, and in fact, when he first got involved, it was thanks to Lee Spiegel. And, uh, you know, he's like, after much sort of back and forth, he agreed to a very small interview that he was just going to talk about the Rockefeller Initiative. But then eventually we, you know, we, we went out and had a couple of lunches. We eventually brought him out to the studio and I started showing him some of the content that we've been gathering. And one of which was the case that was very close to his heart, which is the Socorro case, the landing in 1964, Socorro, New Mexico. And it just so happens that Jacques Vallée was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in April of 1964. And he was telling then scientific advisor, uh, you know, Dr. Jalen Hynek, hey, look, you gotta look at these cases uh, that are explained away in Project Blue Book files as psychological because these are close encounters. And this is what's been happening in France and the same things happening here in the United States. And then of course, two days later, uh, the phone rings and we have that landing in Socorro. So, so Jacques was very, very intimately involved with that case and he saw the effect that it had on Dr. Heineck. Um, and, and at that point, he got more intimately involved and he ended up coming uh, and spending marathon edit sessions with us in this little cabin that had no electricity. We had to run a cord from this house at the end of a dirt road with no running water, no toilet, and no internet. We, and it was, an, it was supposed to be just a sort of temporary place, but magic started to happen because when you got there, not, there was nothing else to do, nowhere else to go but work. And so he was coming out and he would sit at the back of this, in this big chair at the back, and he would say, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> and Jacques would would spent months and months working with us. Uh, tell our audience who Dr. John Mack is, because you also build on his work. You know, he's gone. He, his life was cut short, uh, but he was a trailblazer, uh, a, a courageous man who who pursued this subject at the risk of his own credibility and career. He did. It was a Harvard psychiatrist, um, and he was the guy who with everything to lose and nothing to gain, he was the guy that flew to Africa in 1994, shortly after that landing incident with the school children as witnesses and documented all their testimonies on camera while it was fresh. Um, and and uh, a little inside scoop here, Lawrence Spellman Rockefeller was, was supporting some of his efforts. And I, Harvard University is what I found out, basically was gonna let him go 
and he they got a phone call from from Mr. Rockefeller and said, "Hey, you like those grants you're getting? This guy's not going anywhere." Yeah, so and, and that really made a difference. Then, of course, you know, taking that archival footage from Dr. John Mack and the interviews with the children as a psychologist, and then tracking down the children 20 years later and bringing them together for the first time. And it was truly an historical, I mean, I, it was one of those moments in production where I just thought this is, this is a very special moment. You have a topic like this, it, uh, you know, it, it uh, instigates really strong reactions from people who don't want to believe it uh, or who are over the top in believing it. You see the, those kids at that school as children with Dr. Mack, and then you at, later as adults, they're not making it up. I mean, you can see it on their faces. They're not making this stuff up. What what they're describing really did happen to them. It's funny you should say that because my partner, Rebecca, has never had an interest in UFOs at all. In fact, we never, ever talk about it. And I was sitting in the studio one night and she happened to be there and she walked by and she saw the testimony of these children and she stopped and looked over my shoulder and she was like, <laughs> and then she looked at me and she said, those children are not lying. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I knew based on that reaction alone that uh, what the reaction was gonna be, you know, from the public, you know, general public worldwide. Those children are incredibly compelling. The, uh, the government side of it, of course, you know, the New York Times, since that Times story came out, we learned that there really was a secret government program that's been ongoing despite the denials from uh, the, the military, the Pentagon that it was sponsored by Harry Reid in the beginning, that it uh, had a very broad uh, focus on issues beyond UFOs, uh, that it had collected a lot of information that the public generally has not seen. Y you address uh, cover-up issues and, and with some specific examples, Gordon Cooper, for example, the former astronaut, the late astronaut, who spoke about a, a video or a film that had been recorded of a UFO incident and I know Chris Mellon has tried to go after that, that video. Uh, Jacques Vallée has said many times that he thinks somewhere there should be some giant repository of information, radar sightings, gun camera films, things of that sort. Did you try to track that down? Did you get any indication that something like that exists? Well, let me address that issue with, with Senator Reid because that was, that was a shocking moment for me because I started talking about, you know, the lack of transparency and, and that there's, there's this vault of evidence clearly somewhere. And I gave an example. I said, well, I just happened to interview, you know, Gordon Cooper, Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper back in the 90s. And he was telling me about this. And I was telling Senator Reid on camera. Uh, he was telling me about a landing uh, of, a, of a flying saucer at Edwards Air Force Base circa 1957, and that it was filmed and that he had the film footage, uh, you know, developed. And then he was calling up and he got the higher ups in Washington. He said, eventually a courier jet came in and picked the film footage and he personally handed it over. He said, he looked at it and saw that it was good. You could see in broad daylight, a disc landing and sat on the ground for a couple of, you know, a couple of moments and then lifted back off and shot off at a high rate of speed. But in any case, and as I was telling Senator Reed this story, he finishes my sentence and he said, oh, so he handed the footage over and it was never seen or heard from again. I went, exactly. And I said, do we, do we have stuff like that? And that's when he just, you know, uh, drops the bomb. Yeah, it's there, it's, it's all there. And I said, you mean to tell me there's evidence that hasn't seen the light of day? And I, it was one of those moments where time stops in the room and I could see Senator Reed thinking about his response and is he gonna go there? Picks up a little thing of water and he takes a sip puts the water down and he said, I'm telling you that most of the evidence hadn't seen a lot of day. It was like one of those moments where he went, boom. <laughs> I mean, it was really profound and, and uh, it, it, just one of those moments. And, and, um, I, and I hope that this film will push for further government transparency, just educate the public that there's a lot more out there that we have the right to know about and that well, enough of us will rattle the cage of our representatives and, and action will be taken. Uh, oh, I what action might be taken? You, you interview John Podesta, who clearly has an interest, an ongoing interest in this topic, as did his bosses, Bill and Hillary Clinton. Yes. They have all pushed the edge of the envelope trying to get more information, but were stymied, right? Yeah. So, yeah, they were basically, I, the way Podesta put it, we weren't happy with the answers we were getting. So they were kind of getting the runaround on Roswell. 
uh, because there were a number of cases, specific cases that they, that Lawrence Rockefeller was actually putting tremendous pressure on President Clinton and basically said, if you don't go after some of this stuff, then I'm going to publish the fact on front page of all these different, you know, news articles that you're not going to do it. And uh, so I got the inside scoop on that. And so, okay, well, what do you want us to go after? And he said, well, how about Roswell? So that's, he was really pushing hard things and ultimately it ended up with, we weren't happy with the answers we were getting, which makes you sort of ask the question like, well, if a president can't get access to this, where is, who, who has control? Of course, you'd be able to answer that question much better, better than me, but it does, it is, I do find that fascinating. Um, you know, a lot of people have characterized your film as being part of the disclosure process. This is the next step in, in sort of educating the public and part of disclosure. That's not what you set out to be part of some movement, but it does fit nicely with sort of the zeitgeist of the moment. Hey, look, I'm, I'm in this ride with everybody else right now. This is, this is, you know, this, this film took a village. I had people like yourself and, and dozens and dozens of others working diligently behind the scenes to make this film happen. Um, and, and, and right now it's, it's going to be an exciting ride. And I hope that it's a useful tool uh, to continue pushing for transparency and to educate the public. I mean, but look, I'm just as shocked about it as anybody else. I, you know, I, what can I say? I, it's fast. It's uh, it's it's exciting, very exciting. Part of the challenge is breaking through to regular people out there, so that it's not just something like it's a movie of the week. Oh, that's interesting, and then they go back to their lives. You want them to think about it. You want them to pay attention to it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's why I had a call to action at the end of the film. We just put in. I don't know if you've seen the latest version, but at the end we say, "Hey, please contact your representative and let's let's push for transparency on this topic." And uh, because we want this to be more than just a doc now, it's a movement and it's a tool that can be used to educate not only the, the, the general public, but members, uh, you know, within the Pentagon and to just, you know, I think that's exactly how Lou Elizondo had phrased it, that people that are involved in the new version of ATIP can actually use this as a tool to educate themselves. You've been shooting footage for seven years or so. The film is great. It's expansive, has a wide scope. There's a lot of stuff that didn't make it into this film. What happens next? What are you going to do with all this stuff? So I, I can't go into great detail, but I can say that there are doors opening uh, all over the place right now and that uh, there will be um, another project, a much bigger project. And I would say that uh, if, if things continue to move in the direction that appear to be moving in, this is just going to be the tip of the iceberg. Anything else to add, James? I mean, you, you want people to watch it, obviously. It's available everywhere, basically. Yes, I would say, you know, hey, be part of the movement, support the movement, uh, you know, go to thephenomenonfilm.com. You can look at quotes, you can watch the trailer, you can read about the film, and you can also have links to where you can purchase, download the film. There's a couple of versions, one with extras and one without. And the, you have to go to the link on the film to find out. I think it's Amazon and, and iTunes feature the extras. I put like several hours of extra material in there, but you'd have to go to that link to, to determine exactly who's offering those, those bonus materials. Well, congratulations. It's a terrific piece of work and I look forward to your future ventures. Thank you so much, George, for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. And, and uh, the film is what it is today because of people like you. Thanks, James. Bye. Hey, and one of the things that... Uh that I kind of want to reiterate whenever you watch these trailer and you see this interview is, is these UAPs, these unknown objects, they, uh, they are affecting our nuclear missile launch capabilities. That is not a, something to just scoff at. Harry Reid clearly states that in the interviews we have spoken that we've had with him. You talk to Commander Fravor, these things don't have any insignia. They're not from China, they're not from Russia, and they are outperforming our greatest, our greatest fighters. So uh, see this as, a, I think, a little bit of a call to our politicians as we really need to look deeper into this. This is not just something to be scoffed at. This is a national security issue. This goes way beyond looking at pretty lights in the sky. This is something that could be of a grave concern in a, in a, in a wartime situation. And if you want to, to know much more about any of these topics um, and listen to 
uncut interviews from Harry Reid uh, over the years. Uh, also, Lou Elizondo. Uh, we've got those up on mysterywire.com right now. Um, George, Ron, anything? I just say I hope that uh, I think James's film, it's already been out for a couple of days. It's already the number one documentary film in the world. I, I look forward to it being seen by a much broader audience. It's the kind of thing that can be used as a weapon, I think. You have somebody in your family that you want to say, hey, I work with George and Matt and Mystery Wire, and I'm not crazy, and here's why. You can show them that stuff, uh, that film, and I think it also be used for members of Congress and then maybe other people in the military who have not paid attention to this that gives them a foundation for understanding this stuff is real. It's a legitimate mystery. It affects our national security, and it's, it's fun, too, besides. So... You know, I hope people will watch James's film, and I hope once they're done, they'll come back to Mystery Wire and and dig in a little bit deeper. Absolutely. Yeah. My, no, my kid, my kids are already telling me about it. Okay. No, seriously, George, <laughs> they're asking me for insight on what what it is, what it, what it's about, um, and and they and you're you're the one that's jumped them into it. Of course, they lived in they many of them grew grew up in Vegas. One's up in Reno now. And so they, uh, yeah, they became fascinated watching your coverage over the years here in town. So now they're, they're sort of, they're the ones asking me, they're, they're the inquisitors uh, asking about, and we're all looking forward to this, uh, to this movie coming up this weekend, Duncan. That's right. Um, so that's online. That's streaming the movie, streaming Amazon, YouTube, uh, your standard streams. Um, look for it. And uh, thank you all very much for joining uh, myself, Ron, Matt, George. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Mysterywire.com, home of the unusual and unknown. From Area 51 to the paranormal, it's your source to the most vetted UFO stories and special investigations in the world. Take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com.